Now we're recording. All right, great. And um, Lynn is in the audience. She will be joining us for the first uh, portion of the meeting to talk about town manager goals. Um, so you can let her in at any point, but I'm gonna go ahead and call the meeting to order here. Let me just pull up my agenda. Okay, so I'm calling to order the Governance Organization and Legislation Committee meeting um, on October 26th at 9.02 a.m. Pursuant to chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public are able to access the meeting in real time via Zoom or by telephone. And so we'll just do a quick sound check here. I'll start with you, Pat. Uh, present. And Jennifer. Present. Mandy. Present. And Lynn, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay, you can hear us. Okay, there you are. Good morning. Um, so we have Lynn. Thank you very much, Lynn, for joining us. Uh, Lynn is going to join us for this first piece of the meeting. Um, this will be our first discussion of town manager goals. And then uh, we'll move on to the discharging of firearms. Um, and we do not have a full legal opinion back on the water regulations bylaw yet. Although I did hear from Paul and after we get through this, I'll, I'll because I, I, Mandy, with you not being here last week, I wanna just give you a little bit of an update on that as well. Um, and then depending on timing, we have, uh, the scoring matrix and uh, the um, review of public record status of CAFs. So we'll have to see um, timing wise what we what we'll be able to get done. So I was able to convert the last um, town manager goals into somehow miraculously on my phone in back into a Word document. Did that actually work, Mandy? Have you <laughs> looked at that? I haven't actually looked at the Word document. I probably have the Word document on my computer from last year, though, since yeah. I think I was yeah. the one that modified it in GOL last year. Yeah, I think there might have been something in there that had some markups on it, which was probably from last time around. Um, but I would defer to first Lynn and then Pat and Mandy just to give us a quick overview of how this discussion should take shape and and sort of what is the process for having this discussion. So I'll start with you, Lynn. Oh, thanks. First of all, I, I, I do want to recognize that Pat and Mandy Jo have been part of this in the past. And Mandy Jo, I think you've been the scribe more or less as the discussion took place, as well as kind of doing research. Because one of the first things that has been done is that the goals have been updated to refer to any new policies or bylaws or anything that we've done since the last time. That's number one. The second thing, and since each of you has now either in Pat and Mandy Joe's, in my case, gone through what it's like to evaluate the town manager against these goals and for Jennifer and Michelle, um, I think the word onerous is, um, where, where I keep landing. Um, it's, um, and yet until we stand back and look at both the evaluation process and the goal setting process, I don't know that we, that this is really a GOL decision. I don't think we have an opportunity to tackle this in a different way. Um, I personally look at this and say, if I, in my previous job had this many goals with this much detail, I would have been horrified. Um, and um, that's something that continues to nag me. On the other hand, it does present kind of a record and it reflects, in fact, what the goals are of the council as well. So in many ways, uh, when we evaluate the town manager, we're evalu evaluating him through our lens of whether or not we're achieving what we want to achieve. With that said, I really have nothing more to add. I think this is really a, a rich committee discussion that 
starts with GOL and then comes to the council. Uh, I will say one other thing, and that is that, as I think several of people have noted, during this year, particularly, but this is not unique to this year, this has happened before, different counselors will bring forward things that were not in the goals. The, one of the ones we're wrestling with right now is the whole issue of um, really looking at composting, recycling, and uh, trash composting and recycling. And uh, right now, you know, the Board of Health has a, um, a ha trash hauling and recycling policy, but adding compost is raising a lot of different questions. And yet that's not reflected in the goals. So it's just an example of how do we want to deal with the fact that during any fiscal or calendar year, um, additional issues arise because they're raised by constituents, they're raised by counselors, they're raised by contemporary issues that emerge out there in the world. And how do those get incorporated into the goals? And Mandy Jo and Pat remind me, I think we actually amended the goals one, at least once during mid-year. And um, that this fits into a larger picture. And I guess that what I'm trying to say is that the goals become a center point and how do we fit that into the larger picture? That's really, other than that, I have no particular input into the goals. Thank you, Lynn. Jennifer? Yeah, I just, I thought that was a really good example, like with the waste hauler bylaw, because we actually, it came to a conversation during a recent TSO meeting and Paul just said, those are not in my goals for this year. Mm -hmm. and, and that, and we said, oh, okay, we will work hard to get them in the goals for next year. And we literally said, you know, could this, a grant be submitted to DEP just because it's due now, but we recognize that it's not, you can't start reallocating staff resources to this, but so mm -hmm. that was our, but that was very helpful. I mean, where we did see that, no, we have to get it to next year's because that's how the process works. Two other things. We're also a little off, we are off sync. For instance, we're now evaluating the town manager on a set of goals for calendar year 2022. And yet by the, when he actually submitted his review, his, he pointed out in that review, there were still three months left of the calendar year. Mm -hmm. And there are several things that I know people have been waiting for that he is anticipating trying to complete before 2022. The other thing is the goals are off sync with the, um, with the fiscal year, which, um, but at the same time, they have to coordinate at some level with the fiscal guidelines because, and the fiscal guidelines have to happen as they do about six months in advance of the actual budget. So there's there's a lot of moving parts here. And, you know, this is a terrific group of people and I respect the fact that you're taking on this piece of those moving parts, but just keep in mind all those moving parts. Yeah. Thank you, Lynn. And thank you, Jennifer. Um, are there, Mandy or Pat, would you like to just add any sort of introductory comment before we get into a discussion? No. Okay. Yeah, what's most striking to me is what you said, Lynn, and, and I think I even included this in my evaluation, that it really does feel like these goals are the closest thing to a council vision. And, um, and yet, it's a lot of stuff in there that, um, you know, Paul, uh, if he is using it in like the way that you said, Jennifer, and where he's referencing, that's not in my goals. So um, then it's important for us to be, I thought, I, I actually, I thought the goals were so well done and, and very, very specific, um, which was great. So Mandy, do you want to pull up the... Were you able to find the Word document there? 
or yours or the one that's in the packet. Yes, Pat. Thanks. It, it's that word specific. And are we being, uh, are we, are we trapping change or, or by not having, by being, having so much specificity? Mm -hmm. This is what you work on. This is what you work on. Cause it seems to me that municipal life, government life, management, town management of, it doesn't, really quite work the way we seem to think. And and everybody gets, and I'm being extreme, but you know me, everybody gets their favorite thing in there. And is that really the council vision? Because we, we say certain things and then we work on other things. So I, I'm I, there's part of me that really would like to see what is it that we want to see in a good town manager and how do we evaluate Paul in this instance, um, reflection of what we want in a town manager. And so I, so I don't know, I'd like to see something simpler. That's a great point. And I think to Lynn's point about the whole process um, and where this fits into the process, I have um, heard I felt myself what a bear it was to do this evaluation. Um, and there have been other comments made around how staff perceives the evaluation. Um, and, and so where are we in that thought process about the actual evaluation process and where these goals fit in? <clears throat> Well, we're evaluating him on the, how well he meets the goals. Right, but if we're to, if we're thinking about changing the evaluation process of the town manager for the future, as Liz said, um, we would also include thinking about how we're creating these goals. Right. And I heard Pat say simpler. <laughs> I liked that word. Except. <laughs> You know, there are people, and I'm not saying this about Paul, just structurally, you know, because yeah. you don't know who's different people will be in the town manager position. But if the elected officials don't give specific goals and he can create his own within broad categories, that's giving a lot of power to someone who's not elected. Yep, yep, absolutely. That's also a consideration. Um, yes, Mandy. Um, I agree with Pat and I agree with Jennifer, and, and that's where we've seen, as Pat and Lynn can attest, where we've seen a change in how we present these goals. I think when our first year was here, it was like a list of a hundred and some specific small things that he needed to do. So specific, it was like, you need to do this one thing with this one person in town hall. You know, and it was almost a checklist. And we've moved away in some sense from that checklist, but yet it is still kind of a checklist. And that's why, you know, I think if you look at our policy goal on climate action, we could go as general as, you know, take actions that will allow the town to meet the council's goals on climate action of zero net zero or carbon neutrality by 2050. Um, but that might be too general, right? Because we've got a carp, we've got this, but he probably needs some, or he might, it might be helpful to him. I don't know whether Paul needs it, but I, he might believe and perceive it very helpful if the council said, you know, these are the way, this is the direction we want you to go to start meeting that goal mm -hmm. and giving him some direction. Um, whether it still needs these, I think this one I'm looking, and I just happen to be looking at this one, six specific things. Um, does it need to be that specific or not? I don't know. And I think that's where this committee and then the council has struggled with how do we maintain that balance between, and I'm just using climate action because it's the easiest one and it's the first one. We've adopted a policy, right? That in 2025, we're supposed to have reduced by this number, in 2030, this number, and in 2050, that number between just saying meet that policy and giving him some direction on 
where we'd like to go for him to meet that policy. Um, and I don't know what the right answer is, right? I found myself in evaluating the manager this year, looking more holistically at stuff instead of, even though I did mention some of these specific one through sixes in this one or in this other one, I, I started looking more holistically at, is the town moving towards that? Is and, and what part does the manager play in that? And so do we change the policy side to, you know, these are council policy goals and here's how we think you should meet, meet them. The management goals, I think I still stand behind. We probably have to look a little closer at them and modify them every year. But again, I don't know what the right answer is because I would love to have an easier evaluation process. I what we give him in these four pages is unrealistic for him to comply with completely, right? There's just too much there. Um, but how do we give Paul or any future manager the appropriate level of direction when the council is the policy setter, um, but allow the manager to make decisions that any CEO of any company or nonprofit or town should be making without getting in the manager's way. Can I I'm just, not sure that helped at all because that, I don't really is, have a big thought on it. <laughs> well, I have a follow-up and, and then I'll go to you, Jennifer. Just um, did Mandy, did you do the research of other how other communities do their evaluation and their goals? Or was that some was that Pat or somebody else? Lynn mentioned research. There was a commitment to try to do it and it never got done. And I accept responsibility for that along with the rest of the council. Okay. Yeah, I, I actually don't know what GOL did four years ago. <laughs> That's a long time. <laughs> it was a long no memo from Evan. Was that? Evan, yeah. It might have been before this was even called GOL. It was like a 15 page. He was on GOL, so he might have done right. something. Right. I can try to find that and, try and find it. yeah if we I think having doing a little bit of research on all no I'm it. sorry I'm sorry it was about how to appoint member multiple oh. member bodies I'm sorry oh, was that's the Oka, Oka 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 memo for that yeah, one. Yeah. yeah we got that that was a that. good memo <laughs> Evan writes good memos I, I was going through I'm like oh another Evan memo <laughs> uh Jennifer sorry <laughs> yeah no I just wanted to say picking up what Mandy said is what also came up during TSO and the discussion about waste hauler was, so we, we were actually having a little disagreement of whether uh, that bylaw would was a priority for ECAC. So that's where you also get, if you say, well, work towards implementing the ECAC goals, you know, some people like the, include, you know, the town manager didn't think it was a, necessarily one of their priorities. It was just on the list. Other people thought it was. So that's where maybe some specificity is helpful. Mandy, you said something about, um, and let me know if I didn't hear this right, but council policy goals versus management goals. And I'm that stuck out to me when you said that. So our performance goals are split into two sections. Mm -hmm. the, they, they say right now policy goals and then they say management goals. Um, and the original impetus for that was to say, you know, the manager's got a whole bunch of things that he has to do by the charter um, that in theory doesn't really relate to anything the council wants to get done. And, and that's very general, right? He has to manage the employees. He has to, in some sense, present budgets. Um, they don't necessarily have to be balanced, although there's state laws, but his job is to give the council a budget. That's part of the charter. His job is to administer contracts. His job is to deal with the negotiations of union contracts and stuff like that. And so there's there's a part of these goals that basically are trying to outline and say, you know, he's got all these things. And, and that's particularly the first one under the management goals. We still expect him to do all of that and do it well. But then the council's role beyond being a legislature under the charter is to set the town policy and the council has sort of used this first half of these performance goals in the past to direct or in, you know give vision to what the council's policy um priorities are 
right? Mm -hmm. We've added community health and safety in, in various years. We've added, I think, um, you know, some other things, but we struggled early on with how do we be a policy setter? And one of the tools we've used are these performance goals. And so now he's got the management side and he's also got finding a way to implement and which is part of the charter, implement the policy goals of the council. And so I don't know whether, but I was saying maybe we should just be direct and say those policy goals are the council's policy goals that you need to implement, you know, um, instead of implying that they're his policy goals. Um, but but that's sort of where that split came in. Yeah. Jennifer. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say, because I think on the management, well, I'm getting into my personal opinion. He, you know, we have a town manager that is really excellent at management and administration, has financial skills. And then I found myself on the policy side and maybe more so because I wasn't on the last council, like you're having to evaluate him maybe on implementing a policy you don't agree with. Mm -hmm. So I found myself maybe, I had to realize he hadn't set the policy and it didn't matter whether I agreed with the policy, this is what he was set to do. So that was very challenging and being dispassionate about that. I don't know if I, I was successful. <laughs> That's interesting though. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, I guess Pat. Yeah. And just building on what Jennifer said, you know, about her personal process, whether she, you know, agreed with the goal or not. That's across the town. That's residents are doing that. And so they're, they're really, and that's not, it's almost like there should be a council evaluation. I mean, an election is a council of, uh, you know, individual uh, evaluation in a certain kind of way. But I'm actually seriously saying if we're setting the policy, we want to, and, and Paul is, or the town manager is working on implementing our goals. I can stick waste hauler in uh, commute, you know, health and safety. I can stick it in all these other places. <laughs> and so to, to whether I agree with the waste hauling thing or not isn't really important, but everybody, almost everybody, staff, everybody is responding from their own personal position. And we don't, I don't see how we can really take that into account, uh, you know, your process of, of looking at yourself and saying, I don't agree with this goal, but he's done a good job or a poor job of meeting it. Yay, it was a poor job, I'm happy. That's, you know, <laughs> that's, that, you know, that, so, so something's out of sync and, you know, I don't know. I don't know. I'm blathering. I've been up since 4 a.m. I apologize. No, it's true. I mean, what you said. It's... <laughs> Jennifer went to bed at 4 a.m. Pat woke up at 4 a.m. Lynn caught the joke way late and laughed like 30 seconds after you said it. <laughs> um, that's good. <laughs> um, so I, I just want to add one other thing, and then I want to recognize that we have Anna in the audience. And so if um, Anna, I want to open up a public comment period quickly to just invite Anna to contribute to the discussion. Um, but I quickly just wanted to say, you know, as everyone's talking, what I was thinking about is what is per the charter, the role of the town manager? And I think that's a really important question for us to ask. And I'm wondering if per the charter, um, the role of the town manager is to, like what is the relationship between the role and the implementation of our policy? What is that, like, what is, is, is he, what is that relationship? And I would like to explore that a little bit more because I think that will help us to clarify a little more um, what we're talking about. So Anna, if you, I'm gonna open a public comment period up. Um, let's see, quick, just 
read the quick statement, public comments. So Matt, do I need to read this statement? I'm opening a public comment period up. Anna is the only one in the audience. And if she would like to make a comment right now, um, please raise your hand, Anna. Great. All right. Welcome. Hi, it always feels weird to just stay quiet when like, I know I'm the only one here. I don't necessarily have anything too groundbreaking to share. Um, the only thing I will say is if, if it's possible to switch y'all, I don't know who's um, sh like sharing that or who's the host, but if it's possible to switch y'all to uh, gallery view, then it's, it's a lot easier just as a viewer note. They, oh, that's so much better. Okay, um, so <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I think the, the thing that really intrigues me is how much the, town manager goals set the direction of the council. And, and I think Lynn and I have talked about this way back when we were talking about the, the first retreat was I don't, something I've really struggled with is feeling so bound by priorities uh, and not feeling like there's flexibility to address current events or resident concerns or things like that. And so I'm curious how we can build goals that also include a degree of flexibility without creating an environment that's going to be taking advantage or, or creating an impossible um, an impossible bar to clear, right? So I know that um, Nandy and I have dealt with this with the streetlight thing. That was something that came up. It was not something that I think we would have necessarily prioritized in the last set of goals, but that doesn't mean it's not important. Um, and that same thing uh, goes for, for composting and zero waste, right? So I think one of the things that I'm really curious about as we go into this goal setting process is one, why are the why is the council so deeply bound by the town manager goals? And two, how do we introduce flexibility while still creating an environment that things can get done, right? Creating a goal that says be flexible and meet our every need is not reasonable. Um, so I'm 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 messing with those. Um, and you know, I yeah, I guess I'll I'll pause there. Thank you, Anna. Thanks. Anna. Sorry, Lynn, go ahead. Uh, no, I, I just, it, and this is something that Anna and I have discussed and, and I'm sure Mandy Joe and I have discussed at some point. Um, another thing I wanna really emphasize is that the town manager works for the council. He is the full-time executive of the town. I don't know about the rest of you, but I didn't go on the council to do administrative work. Now I do some because of being president. <laughs> some. Those of you that are chairs do some because of being chairs of committees, okay? But, you know, for instance, I was recently, someone tried to draw me into a dispute resolution over a fiscal matter with the town. It's not my job, but, when we set our goals, that becomes our statement to the town manager of where we expect him to spend time, where we expect him to assign staff, where we expect him to place budget priority. And if we don't do that to the town manager, then I think we've been remiss in providing vision and direction for the town manager and the town. So uh, it's it's walking a fine line, but it's one we need to all remember. We are not the paid full-time executive of the town. That's all I have to say. Thank you, Lynn. Mandy? So I wonder if it's time for us to remove the policy goals from the manager performance goals in the specificity that they are and instead put a goal in there that sort of mimics the language in this first climate action goal because the first climate action goal is to prioritize and implement regulatory fiscal and other actions to meet the climate action goals adopted by the council but could we have a management goal of prioritize and implement regulatory fiscal and other actions to meet the town council's policy goals and then the council adopt a document that basically looks like these first what what in the draft 
in the performance goals this year is the policy goals, where we basically split it up and say, here are the council's goals. And we expect the manager to implement through those regulatory, fiscal, other whatever actions, those goals in the manner he sees fit. Um, and then at the same time, going to Anna's thing, putting somewhere in that goal and also other additional, you know, legislative actions that are proposed and referred to the council committees or something, right? Because we can say we need climate action, we need economic vitality, we need health and safety and diversity, equity, inclusion, and all of this. But as Anna said, waste hauling might fit into that lighting might fit into that right but things might come up that don't really fit into that that we'd still need staff support for um and so can maybe the the thing to do is split this document into a council policy priorities and then just a management a manager performance goals that re references the council's policy priorities I think I saw Jennifer and then Lynn. So let's just try and um, follow this through. So with the waste hauler bylaw, that gets the it gets referred to TSO, and then with what you know, Amanda you just outlined. So what if you know a, the town manager were to say that's, that? So then it's up to him to decide whether he wants to include it in his action items. Mm -hmm. See, because if we say it's a goal for, let's say, the coming year, then he, it will be addressed, but. I think I understand what you're saying is that he has more discretion and um, more sort of power to decide which he's going to take up if we're, yeah. Um, okay, Lynn and then Mandy. I like Mandy Joe's suggestion. I. I would take your all your management goals and lob, lob, put them into one goal so that you don't lose kind of the broad sense of each of the goals underneath. And that, you know, maybe then means we have seven goals. Okay. It's just, but I like the idea that we recognize that the, the top six are the council's priorities. And then we provide some flexibility. But I really want to also emphasize if the ability to put that in this year's budget, whatever it is, isn't there, then we can't evaluate the town manager negatively if he if we didn't put it in the budget. So, you know, for example, I'm, you know, street lighting now. Maybe that's going to be a multi-year goal to change the shades on the streetlights, okay? That, that Whatever that is or whatever else might happen. And so we just need to understand that, this, which brings me to my second point. These are multi-year goals. And, when you, and we all began to recognize that, I think, last year or the year before, which is one of the reasons why we keep amending these goals, because we recognize we're not gonna achieve climate action in one year. Um, and yet it's going to remain a goal for because of its importance. The same thing is true for all the rest of them. That's all, thank you. Mm -hmm. Mandy. Yeah, I just wanna say Jennifer's got a good point, um, but I, I think we could figure out a way to word the language in either the council policy goals or the performance review document to indicate that when you know and it might just require in the past the council's done things like directing the manager to do something or changing our own goals as part of x motion right when we were we did that a lot um in 2020 as we were adopting um CSWG things and and looking towards Cress and all a lot of the motions also included just changing the policy goal part of the performance review document um, to, to get that in there somehow, but it could have some sort of his, his under town, I don't know, there's, there's like a management goal about town council 
what's it called, relationship with the town council. Part of that one could be supporting all of the committees at a staff level that reflects any changes in town council policies or new legislative priorities and proposals or something like that, where that's where it would come into sort of better specifying to the manager, you know, climate action and health safety and welfare now includes this waste hauling, for example, um, because the councils refer to it, it's a legislative thing and through these other management goals, you have to support it. There's probably a way to do it is I guess what I'm saying. Would somebody um, speak to the relationship between the goals and the budget guidelines? So Lynn, you had mentioned that and I, it would help me to see how those two fit together as well. Like maybe one concrete. Yeah, I, uh, I mean, my interpretation and having been on the finance committee, I guess since its inception, um, when the finance committee develops the goals, I mean, the, the guidelines, it clearly takes into account the goals, okay? Mm -hmm. Very definitely takes into account the goals. There has been some debate in the past about how closely it should reference those goals. And I imagine that debate will take place again this year. But it definitely drives, which is one of the reasons why it's important that we're having the goals discussion before the guidelines discussion. And yet we're having it right after each of you have, well, I wanna accept, except for one, have done your town manager evaluations, okay? So you, it's fresh in your mind. So mm. it's a good sequence is what I'm saying. And yes, it's totally taken into consideration in the guide, financial guidelines. Mm -hmm. Jennifer. Yeah, so is this a good example of where something arose and it was able to just be dealt with and that's the changes to the sewer and water line by law. You know, that was an issue that came up this calendar year mm -hmm. and it got dealt with this calendar, you know. Mm -hmm. So that that was maybe because it didn't require beyond a certain um level of resources and, and staff time that it could happen now and wasn't like for that we weren't advised to have that in the next year's goals. Yeah, and, and that's a great example of something that arose because of a constituent and frankly many more constituents since then uh that keep emerging over this issue. And I'm going to be honest and say because of declining infrastructure under the ground around Amherst and the rest of the country, that we're gonna see this goal be much more important over the next several years. Um, so, but it's an excellent example. The reality is the financial part of that isn't gonna happen until after the fiscal year following the year in which we adopt them. So if we adopt sewer and water this year, the first we're gonna see the implementation is when we adopt the sewer and water fees for FY24. So there's, it's one of those things, but it, it's taken an enormous amount of staff time. We're fortunate to have Amy Rusick as um, the, you know, being the expert that she is on these issues. Um, but it's an excellent example. Um, I am still coming back to this question in my mind of what the role of the town manager with respect to not being an elected official and what discretion we believe the town manager has to chase a vision or to implement or execute on a vision versus, um, you know, the council and Lynn, yes, please. I, I meant to say this earlier, at some point in the very near future, GOL should ask the town manager to meet with you to give his input on any proposed goals. Uh, I Maybe even at the next meeting, 
I, mm. there's a point at which he should give you some input. And he may say, hey, listen, I see this issue coming up this next year, and I don't think there's any way to avoid it. And so please consider that. Okay. Yes, Lynn. And I, that was actually the next point I was going to make is or ask about is, do we want to invite the town manager on November 9th, which is our second discussion? Um, and is there anybody else that we should be, uh, I, I can't imagine someone in my head right now, but that there where feedback would be helpful to receive feedback from on this. All right. Well, it's 942. I think we've had a good first discussion on this. I will absolutely invite Paul um, to join and wondering if in terms of like other counselors, I'm really happy that Anna was here to participate. Um, maybe just letting people know that we are talking about this in GOL if they want to join. Um, yes, Mandy. Obviously, just as a public comment matter, not to join. Mandy. I just wanted to know what we as a committee, as committee members should be doing to prepare for that next meeting. Should I be reviewing the whole goal document and coming in with how I'd amend it um, or what amendments I'd like to see? Um, or are we still sort of just talking in broad terms where that's a little premature? I guess I just wanna know what I should be doing to be ready and so that we can have a very productive conversation. This one has been productive, um, but at some point we need a document, right? And so what what should we do? In my experience, Mandy, when you um, do start to put pen to paper on something, it does help to guide us. So if you have time between now and then to be able to do some of that, I think it would be really helpful. In the meantime, I think um, I would like to do a little bit of research about what other communities are doing, maybe look at some other communities' goals if they're published, um, and then be able to provide that information to the committee. Uh, and then maybe um, the rest of the committee members can also be thinking about, uh, you know, what we've talked about today. And I really think that the discussion coming back to the management goals versus the policy goals is something that we should really, and maybe when you're thinking about it, Mandy, if just honing in on that idea and using that as a step forward to talk about it next time. Does that work? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, all right. Lynn, do you have any any other comments or okay? <laughs> On to my next meeting is okay. which starts at 10. Bye. Thank you, Lynn. Thanks a lot Thanks. for joining us. Thank you. Thank you for asking. Great. Great. So um I am just looking quickly. Let's see. Um, so we have the discharging of firearms um, bylaw. We received a pretty thorough legal opinion from KP Law. Um, and so we can come back. This is bylaw 3.22 discharging of firearms. And just to be clear, in case somebody's watching the video, this is a, this is a bylaw that we've already begin, begun to review and we're waiting on a legal opinion. And if you would like to see that legal opinion, it is in the packet for this week's GOL meeting. Um, and I did send a note to Chief Livingstone. I gave him the, uh, you know, option to come. I did only send it early this morning. So I didn't um, have just with everything going on, hadn't had a chance to speak with him sooner about it, but he had provided initial input and he also was copied on the legal opinion. Um, Paul copied him. So he had a chance to see that and I hadn't heard any feedback from him after receiving that. So did everyone have a chance to look at that? The legal? Okay. So I'm just going to open up the floor um, for comments um, or questions about the legal opinion and see what we got. Yeah. 
and we could, I could um, just bring that up here. I think. Yes, Mandy. So I'm still processing it, but I think the way I read it was removing the shotgun exception doesn't affect the laws related to hunting in the town in, in Massachusetts and in the town, which was one of my biggest concerns about removing the shotgun exception. And on the other hand, the whole bylaw itself continues to be subject to massive amounts of challenges is sort of how I interpreted this entire legal opinion in my first read. I haven't had a chance to do more than sort of briefly read it right now. And so is that the same way that other people sort of interpreted what was said that we can remove it as long as we don't touch that sort of opening section and I'm trying to pull up the, the general bylaws without really almost changing a lot of the effect of the bylaw, yet because of least recent Supreme Court rulings in Bruin, the whole bylaw is potentially subject to challenge no matter what. Um, and if that's the same interpretation other people have, I might, I just wanna make sure that other people have that same interpretation before I make comments on that one. Pat? I see Pat shaking her head. <laughs> no, I was agreeing with that interpretation. Yes, I also agree. Um, that is how I interpreted it. Um, and so it, I think keeping that MGL, keeping that piece in there is necessary. Um, and it does not affect, as she, as she said, it's not a hunting bylaw. Um, and yet, She's also saying that there's been issues with these and may continue to be issues with these. So absolutely. Jennifer, did you, is was that your sense of things? I hadn't read it. I have to, oh. I missed it in the packet. So I can't. Oh, okay. Um, well, let me, I, I'm not able to share my screen. No, um, I do. I brought it up. So I have it here. I was looking at it. I'm just going to share it quickly in case if, you know, someone watches over this and if we want to just look at it, let me see if there we go. Thank you. Um, okay. So here we go. One of the things I didn't have the opportunity to do was to click on, it said that other municipalities had done similar. It said that somewhere. Um, and was there a link or? There's a link to the Bruin case, but I don't remember a link to other communities. Yeah. And the link to the Bruin is KP laws, um, one of their legislative updates or or things that right. we regularly get. I don't think it's the language of the case. I think it's their summary of what that means for towns in Massachusetts. Yeah, I think you're right. You know, I keep bouncing back to the a uh, guy who came into town hall with his video recorder because he could. Um, yeah, I don't think it almost matters. I mean, it does matter what the law says. It's going to be challenged in Massachusetts is a state where, um, <laughs> if you've been watching MSNBC enough, you know that will be a target state on so many levels. Uh, um, I don't know. Yeah. Jennifer was watching MSNBC. That was the joke. Um, <laughs> Amanda, you weren't here yet when she said why I couldn't sleep last night. <laughs> um, Mandy. <laughs> yeah. So to Pat's point, and what I wanted to say, if that was our interpretation is if Massachusetts is being a target, is the change to remove the discharge of shotguns or air guns that we've been talking about 
a big enough change to potentially bring that target down on Amherst? Because right now, I guess one of the things I'm looking at, given this opinion, is yes, we could do it. Yes, we could put it on our agenda. Yes, we could put it on our bulletin board and do it. But that puts it out there a lot more in the public, such that it might bring a legal challenge more quickly to our town versus another town, because we'd be actually modifying something than if we just let things lie as they are. Um, I, I don't know. This is just a question of would actively trying to amend this now bring about potentially that target to Amherst versus some other town? And is it worth doing this amendment now if that isn't a real possibility? And I could just be speculating way too much, but that's what I wanted to say. And I don't know where I stand on that, but it was one thing that hit my mind. Yeah, Pat. Yeah. Um, what comes up for me when I hear us, um, because I've had that response in myself too, when I hear us sort of saying, oh, well, maybe we shouldn't do this because we're going to draw attention to Amherst. And I go back to the sanctuary bylaw which brought us um, making Amherst a sanctuary city was a bylaw that targeted us for a while. Things are much worse now, but I, I, I am really uncomfortable with our fear being what guides us. And, and you know, I don't want the town sued. I don't, you know, there's all kinds of things I worry about, but, um, if, the, if fear determines what we're allowed to do as, as legislators, or uh, I, we're, that's extremely problematic. Um, so I think we should decide what we want to do and take the risk. Um, I agree. Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, it's been bubbling up for a while in this discussion that this is a political issue. And I appreciate what Mandy's bringing forward. Yeah. And, um, and I also um, agree that I think that shouldn't be our guide in terms of how we decide to move forward with this. That does bring the earlier point that Mandy made, I think maybe in, a, in the first discussion about, you know, what we're trying to solve here. And I think the answer, it really is a statement. It's a political statement in a lot of ways, what we would be doing in this change. And so it's possible that that is a council discussion. You know, we can make a recommendation <clears throat> as a committee, but also being aware that there's a bigger discussion to be had about what Pat just really brought out, which is where are we as a town in terms of, I mean, some of the things that we're doing, crests, reparations, other things, they are, they're political issues and they're issues that are putting, shining the light on us. And where are we as a council um, with respect to that? And I think that's a really, really rich point of discussion. Um, and this could be a catalyst for that if that's how we want to um, approach it, or if it's a separate conversation that is sort of originated from this particular recommendation that we might make. I'm going to take this down. Um, so I am personally prepared to move um, to recommend that we remove that exemption, um, but I don't want to do that before all of that we've had a that we've had a discussion um, that covers everybody's questions and and if there's anything more, I just wanted to check my email quick to make sure that Chief Livingstone um didn't send a reply um to my email check real quick no so i don't have anything additional paul seeing the um seeing the legal review also did not provide any additional feedback yes jennifer wait so i just want to remember when you say 
remove the exemption. So there will be an exemption for hunting. Or would that be removed? No, everything else would stay the same. The only thing we'd be removing is that, is it A? Um, I think it's A, right? Uh, Mindy, A1. muted. A1. A1. We'd need to renumber and reformat the rest of the bylaw, but um, A1, and, and that's why I wanted to clarify my understanding, because my understanding of reading that legal opinion is that shotgun, air gun line, whether it's there or not, hunting is controlled by state law not right. whatever we do and so it doesn't actually have its presence or absence has no bearing on whether people are allowed to hunt and in what circumstances and how right particularly basically one of my big concerns yeah. so. <laughs> primary yeah yeah, and I think, you know, we had talked about a, a hunting bylaw, and, and, sh and she mentions that this is not a hunting bylaw, um, but it covers, uh, the state law allows for that, so that's, so, so yeah, uh, Jennifer would just be removing that one, okay. A. Is there any other, um, any other comments or, or? points of discussion on this would and Mandy are you still in in sort of thinking mode or no I'm good I'm good okay. I just <laughs> I, like I said I had briefly read it and I know some people have read it more so I wanted to make sure my brief reading was in conformance with what other people thought it said okay all right so when a motion is made um, in this case, as you said, in order to format, reformat, does any of that have to be in the motion or does that sort of happen automatically? I think the motion should just say, you know, if, if it's to delete section A1, then it could say, and to renumber subsequent se sections appropriately. Athena's got her hand up, so she'll tell yes. you that. <laughs> can, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Sorry. I'm new heads up. Um, I think it's either in the rules or the chair somewhere that says the town clerk just automatically renumbers things as they're amended. So I don't think we have to, you know, instruct the town clerk to do that. She just does it as a matter of course when bylaws are amended. Perfect. <laughs> Even better. <laughs> All right, so if there isn't more discussion, I am going to move uh, to delete. Section A1 from bylaw 3.22, discharging of firearms. And Second. great. Okay. And is there any further discussion? I will write a thorough memo on this one, by the way, for the council, <laughs> including the legal. Yes, um, Mandy. I was just going to say, could you include the legal opinion in the memo? Definitely. Athena? Um, Sorry for, I didn't raise my hand. I have my hands up somewhere else, but um, can I, so your motion is to recommend an amendment to, I, I'm, is it okay if I fiddle with those words to recommend an yes. amendment to delete? And the, okay, thank you. Yes, <laughs> that would be great. <laughs> um, thank okay. God for you, honey. No. <laughs> um, all right, any other discussion? Okay, let's start. Um, uh, with you, Jennifer. Uh, I. I. M and I. Mandy. <laughs> <laughs> I. Okay. And Pat. I. <laughs> awesome. All right. So that one passes unanimously, and uh, with let one absence. With one absence. Thank you. Good call. All right. Excellent. So, let me just take a quick peek here. Um, I want to quickly check in. I had previously asked Anna to be a mock person for um, our uh, in interview with this ma scoring matrix. So I, I'm just checking in. Anna, um, would you raise your hand if you were expecting to be playing that role today? <laughs> okay. Um, Athena, if you could bring Anna in, that would be great.
I don't have to. I'm always okay. happy to be a COO. Um, I actually almost texted you this morning to confirm, but it's totally fine. Happy to be here anyway. I'm doing other stuff too. Okay. So I'm not sure where we're going to go. Well, Pat, go ahead. You were going to say something. No, else. I was going to make a flip remark. I, I, what? I Are you making fun of my, my flip I was going to say, here? it doesn't matter what you do. We'd never hire you. Oh! We'd never select you. <laughs> so that's Probably. a waste. I don't know whether that's a wise move or not, Pat, honestly. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, well, the idea was Mandy, since you weren't here last time we had talked, um, actually Anna brought us through last time, um, had created a sample, uh, matrix and sort of, it was, I think Anna acknowledged it was sort of briefly put together based on the, um, interview questions that were being used. Um, so it wasn't like set in stone. It was just sort of put out there. And we had decided that we could potentially go through and try to use the um, the matrix. Now, I just want to look at the agenda and ask everybody. Um, so quickly on the water regulations bylaw, just to get that out of the way. Um, Paul says there are a couple of small things they need to follow up on. Um, it won't be ready until November 9th. And one of the questions will be setting the quantum of fines you want to impose. They will put the maximum in the bylaw and the council can choose the level of fine you want to impose. So Anna, would you just fill in Mandy since she was not here at our meeting last week, sort of what happened when we started reviewing this bylaw um, in the meeting last week and then recognize that the fee piece basically was and the enforcement stuff was un we still had questions yeah basically um my brain was so much on the regulations that um i did not set um did not work with tso to set proposed fine amounts in the bylaw uh, and so when we went through it at gol we needed to confirm that they were aligned with um aligned with state requirements but also to basically to confirm that we're able to not need to redo the entire regulations in order to adjust the fine amounts. And so we were just playing with wording to uh, navigate how to do that best. But I sent you stuff with a bunch of X's and TBDs and that's not, that's basically the, the long and short of it. Thank you, Mandy. Just a couple of questions for whoever's contacting Paul and all and doing this. So, I think I had this question first, and, and it's one that I'm concerned about. The bylaw has a violation and a fine, but the bylaw only allows, it basically says the council can adopt regulations and here's how they do it. I'm not sure that means the violation of the regulations have a fine. And so that's one of the questions I would have as we delve into this, if, if there's still legal opinions, where do the violation of the regulations find, or do we have to put that somewhere in the bylaw that this fine covers if the council doesn't adopt regulations, but also any violations of the regulations? Yeah, it should be in the appendix of the regulations and the way the bylaw is written. I got I don't have it pulled up in front of me, sorry. Um, but it should be in the appendix. I think it's appendix A and the way the bylaw is written, um, it should allow us to uh, adjust, just Appendix A without having to revisit the entire um, the entire kit and caboodle. And I I apologize I don't have it up. It was not um, super yeah. perfect to talk about it today, but um, I'll I'll confirm that. Yeah, so but that was the idea is that we don't need to like open the whole envelope in order to adjust rates, but also there are there are um, fines as set forth in the in the in the regulations. Okay, uh, I'll, I'll have to think about that more and, and read this a little more closely on how that goes. But that that was one of my concerns. So yeah, and there there's specific violations. They're not just if you violate any regulation, right? There are certain specific violations that pertain to different elements of the regulation. So like, I'm gonna I might be giving a, an untrue example, but one of them was you know if you have a violation relating to a fire hydrant, it's going to be a different course of action than if you have a violation related to like paying your water bill or something. Um, and so it's not just one blanket, you violated the regs, because we also have an entire appeals process in there as well. 
-hmm. So I guess the next question I would have is, do we need fine, do we need penalties for violation of the bylaw? Um, Cause if the bylaw itself is only the council sets regulations and the regulations set, I see it fines for violating of the regulations. Does the bylaw itself need this data block and penalties? I think Athena might come save me, but she also might make my life. She might give me more good questions to answer. I don't know. <laughs> Athena, please. Thanks. That was exactly my question last time we talked about this. If there are, are fines in the bylaw, do we need to have those fines copied into the regulations or vice versa? My understanding was that the bylaw just needs to point at the regulations where all the fines exist so that when we update those, we don't have to modify the bylaw. That was my understanding of what we wanted the process to look like. And so when we looked at the bylaw and there are fines and there's an enforcement authority and so forth, it was like, do we need this section or can we just say, point at the regulations in that section? And that's, that's what my understanding was that we wanted to do, um, but it seemed like we weren't sure about what legal references needed to be included there and the language that we ought to use. Um, and it seemed like maybe everybody wasn't on the same page in terms of how that should be worded in the bylaw. So are there specific questions? Um, Anna, I'm just going to pull up the questions that you sent to Paul so that we can, is that okay if I pull up that yeah. email? And then that way um, we can make sure that what is being addressed uh, is what we want. So let's see, there we go. Okay. So this is what Anna has sent to have answered. And I'm sure I probably should have included this in the packet. So I apologize for not doing that. And I um, will, um, Athena, I think is copied on this, but I will make sure Athena gets this again to include it. Um, so and DPW enforcement that I'm really good at writing y'all. When I, talk, uh, I said, can DPW enforcement to that? I just love when love when my quick fire off emails are in public record. I mean, they're always public record, but you know, you can make an amendment if you'd like before we submit it. Like it's already like public record. Yeah, that's pretty funny, actually. Something with a preposition. Oh man. Okay. I mean, I think number six covers sort of what I was asking, which is what's the data block in the bylaw actually, what does that fine apply to? And I read it as applying to the council not instituting regulations or the regulation amendments not coming from the manager. I've got some questions with the language of the bylaw, but, um, but I don't read that data block as having any effect on if a, if a regulation is violated, what penalty comes in then? And I think number six is what that sort of says or is talking about. And this is, I think, what Athena was also yeah. getting, right? Yeah. yeah. So I'm not sure we have to add, I don't think I have any other questions to add. Okay. Perfect. Do, do any other members have? additional questions to add. Okay, Mandy, you just said that you have some comments on the bylaw itself. I think when we received the bylaw, I don't think TSO had made any changes to what Paul had proposed. Is that correct, Anna? Uh, significant, right? Cause, oh, we not. No, because all we had was in his memo. I remember talking about that last time. It was just that bylaw. Um, so Mandy, do you want to uh, review the recommendations that you have now, since we have Anna here, and are you ready to do that? I should say. I mean, I could talk about them. I just always wonder: is it GOL's place to talk about parts of the substance that I don't like? Right? I, I'm. Oh, I see. That, that's why I, I I hesitate to do that. Um, I could probably couch some of them as a clarity or consistency thing, um, yeah. but mostly it's substantive that I've got right. concerns with. And I'm happy to talk to Anna about that offline if she wants to hear what my 
other concerns are, but that's why I hesitate to say anything other than what I've said about my questions. Yeah, that might be helpful. Athena, do you know um, when this is coming back up? At, I don't know if you've talked to Anika at all about the TSO agenda, otherwise I can reach out to her. I don't think we have an agenda set for okay. the next meeting yet. So um, Great. one of us can. Yeah, because Mandy, while you're at it, if you, oh, I'm sorry, Athena. Go ahead. I was going to say, Mandy, if you're, while you're at it, if you, the, the sewer one is basically identical. So um, I'd like to be, I'd like to be done with this. Um, and so uh, comments on that, that I assume would be very similar, would be welcome. I'm going to try to get both of them done at the same time at TSL. Mandy, uh, last time we talked about this, uh, just before we actually pulled it up to look at it, all the members were like, this thing flew through faster than anything else. And this, <laughs> you know, everybody was giving all of these accolades. And then we got to it and we we're like, halt. And Anna's like, oh God, <laughs> it was really funny. <laughs> talking about water. <laughs> no, but this is, I, you know, I, at one TSO, I was saying this was amazing. I think you thought I was just referring to how fast it went that night, but I wasn't. It was this whole <laughs> process is just a model for things can actually get done. <laughs> All credit goes to Amy Rusecki, truly. I, I think oh, CRC is you. still in the same way that TSO on water is with its flood maps. <laughs> we're just like, we're ready to be done. <laughs> I'm ready to be done and I'm not even on CRC. I haven't even been talking about it. <laughs> Only been a decade. I don't know. I seriously. <laughs> um, Anna, why are the um, bylaws going back to TS? Didn't the water bylaw already go through TSO or? It did, but these are such substantive changes that oh. it needs to go back. So, so it would go back as because of the substantive changes that we've talked about. That's my take. Yeah. Okay. All right. So yeah, Mandy, if you could get with Anna offline, then we'll yep. we'll just move on from that. That would be great. Okay. Um, so now we have the option of either try attempting to do a mock interview or continuing discussion on the um matrix or the long awaited review of public record status of CAFs is also on our agenda for today. So um, and I know that Mandy really wanted to be here for that and speak to that. So we waited on that one. Um, so Thank I'm, you for that. of course, yeah. Um, so I'm open to, yes, Jennifer. So I just wanted to ask, this is CAFs that are for the town manager appointed uh, multiple member bodies because aren't the council's CAFs already public? Or no, no, nobody's CAFs are public. Okay. Just we see the council ones, we don't see the town ones. That's the- But the public doesn't see any of them. Okay. Right. Um, so why don't we, um, Anna, are you, I think let's let's take that on and table the matrix um, until we have like a little bit more time and just, there was a lot already that happened this morning. So I'd want to be more organized with that, but you're, you know, welcome to stay if you want for this piece. But uh, I, I will, I'll head back to the audience. Um, I cannot be here at your next meeting, just so you know, okay. um, at, which is the ninth, correct? Yes, it is. Uh, I can be here. I don't know if you're meeting the day before Thanksgiving, but I could be here. That, we can talk, but I just, I know I won't be able to be here next time. Okay. Um, that's not to say we should do it. I think your plan sounds fine because um, okay. there's more you could do before getting to a mock interview anyway. Okay. And then also I'm wondering if um, for the water, because that is going to be, we're going to have that legal review back. Yeah. For the, um, Paul did say that he will get it to me way in advance of the ninth so i could send you know you'd get it too um because and then you could just provide comments if you need to in advance okay okay, okay. and i can see if someone else from tso can be there if you would like me to um or well anika's on anika will be here yeah, yeah. Right, right okay so maybe she can speak to it if i'm not here thanks y'all right. have a Thank good rest you. of you okay bye-bye all right um so i am going to yeah. turn it oh Sorry, no, Pat, I, I missed your hand. hand. I'm sorry. No, I didn't. I just put it up after I spoke. <laughs> Trying to <Yeah>. cover my, uh, tush. 
Um, I, I really, and this isn't quite part of the agenda, but it's, it's part of the uh, selection process in terms of the SOI. We give um, interviewees the questions in advance. And I would like us to think about why we're doing that. Um, I'm, I think that there's something important in interviews I've been in and ones that where I've been interviewing other people, I want to know what my questions are and I want to ask the same questions to everyone. But uh, my follow-up questions are based on what's there, what's shared, but also um, it, it gives me more of an insight into the person and how they think than having time to prepare and write it out and do all of that. So it's just, I don't wanna waste our time, but that's something I really want us to think about. I'm gonna mute us, my phone's ringing. Okay. Yeah, that's a good question. And I do remember that coming up. I don't know if it was when we were uh, interviewing for the finance appointment, but I remember we briefly touched on that. Mandy. Yeah, um, and I'll just give a quick summary as the, tug and pull of this from my point of view, which is if the committee agrees to the questions, because the committee has, you know, if, if we've got a policy that says the committee picks the questions, well, that's done in a public meeting. And so if you're doing it in a public meeting and then you're not, just, if, if you then don't send them to all candidates, there's been an argument made that you are then preferencing the candidates that know to pay attention to the prior meeting to find out what the mm -hmm. questions are. Um, and so it's a tug and pull between do does the committee come up with questions as a committee or and, and then should they be disclosed because you don't want to preference the candidates that know town government um, or does each individual committee member come up with a question and Pat and I have been in committees that have done it both ways <laughs> but but that sort of has has been historically the tug and pull in that one um, in particular as to why it's kind of like that. And I'm, I, I certainly am open to that discussion again, because as with Pat, I find it strange. <laughs> but. <laughs> but equally strange not to do it because of what you point out and actually the, equi the equitable piece about that. And that that's really, yeah, thanks for pointing that out. Um, so do we wanna maybe sit with Pat's question, and um, we're not going to answer it right now, um, Jennifer, or we can, or we. <laughs> yeah, so I guess along those, I mean, in terms of being able to ask follow up questions, it, it seems like a natural that I mean, that is how interviews are conducted. But yeah, I mean, how do they not maybe get a little not meaning to? I mean, I could see them getting a little confrontational if people really get into. Um, you know, I mean, can we avoid that happening where somebody gives a response, somebody doesn't agree with it, and then has, you know, that they start to debating that issue? Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. And if an individual, if individual counselors are making, are coming up with questions that haven't been discussed by the full committee, there might be not be congruence and it could turn into a situation where one committee member asks a question that other committee members feel like is out of line or yeah. out of line and then it's like then we're in a conflict as a body you know so that's and you really don't want to make it onerous because we want people to apply yeah yeah, yeah so. absolutely yep all right mandy do you want to talk about the um the caps yeah, well, I just want to say thank you for waiting until I could be at a meeting to talk about this. Um, it's been a struggle for the council since day one, both on whether the CAFs for council committed, mul co appointed multiple member bodies are released, and also whether the council or even the public gets to see those CAFs that were submitted for manager appointed multiple member bodies. And um, right now, I still stand with keeping them private, but I wanted to bring up, and, and yet I, I, I'm open to this conversation, but one thing that I, I wanted to bring up about why at least the council ones, um, 
Mm, where I stand on that one a little bit more, and I haven't thought much about the manager ones, I'll say that at all, um, is we've seen a lot of people apply or submit CAFs, um, you know, even for finance, but particularly if you go back two or three years, there's 20 or 30 CAFs submitted for anyone, sometimes planning board or, or um, zoning board of appeals, normally planning board has a higher number. Um, yet, as people have seen, when we get to the interview stage, when we get to that SOI stage, there's only about five sometimes or less, three. Um, and one thing that worries me in releasing everyone's name mm. is it does not give a person sort of the ability to at one point read a newspaper article and say, oh, hey, I might be interested and then pull out without their name coming up and potentially then being contacted by X number of people in the public of why didn't you do this? Why did you pull out? Why that? And then having to justify to people in the public why they chose not to submit an SOI. Um, if we're looking for more people to apply, I don't know whether it's wise for us to put residents in that position to have to potentially defend why they stopped the process before submitting an SOI. Um, because if personally, if I was in that situation and I, I pulled out because, you know, my job situation changed or my family life situation changed, it would be uncomfortable for me to have my name out there that and potentially people saying, and coming to me and saying, well, why didn't you stay with that? You should have submitted your SOI and then having to reveal or feeling pressured to reveal personal information in a way that it might not be comfortable in revealing. And so I just wanted to put that out there as a potential, do we want to have grace and forgiveness and, and you know, um, acceptance that people's situations change? especially when we're doing a two-year look back or a three-year look back, um, such that they're allowed to change their mind without having their name put out in public that at one point they thought of serving. Thank you, Mandy. I saw Pat and then Jennifer. Uh, grace and forgiveness. Hmm. I haven't thought about your uh, what you're saying, and there's some validity to it. So, but um, but um, years ago, before I was involved in town government, or Carol was, uh, you know, no interest in town meeting, nothing. Um, Carol was friends with Mac McNerney, who was on the planning board, and he, because she was involved with community land trusts for the through the Institute of Community Economics. Um, he really, really wanted her to apply for the planning board. And she did. Um, and she never even got an interview. And what's interesting, and, you know, that again, she submitted whatever you had to submit. And the only reason I, I, and then Mac came back and he said, oh, the comment was, he said, I'm really sorry because I encourage you to do this. But the comment was, oh, what has she got some kind of commie agenda? So she never, and I don't know who said it and I don't care. And this was years and years ago, but to me, not being able to see who has applied, it triggers that. It triggers, well, how, why were they kept off? And so I hear what you're saying about uh, balancing, you know, uh, a person having to explain. Generally speaking, I think I'd only call somebody up and say, oh, you know, Jennifer, I'm, I, I really wish you had gone through with that SOI. I'd love to see you on the committee. And if I know them well, what happened? You know, I don't see people all over town calling people. But I, as I said, I haven't thought about that. I think there's, there's, I don't know. The, I don't know. I want to know who's applying because I'm a counselor. I find out sort of more than the public. Um, but I don't know. So it's just, I'm there. Jennifer? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I would err on, 
first of all, if somebody applies, I mean, they have put their name out there. So they put their name in the, in the public space by completing the CAF that they submitted. Um, I, I don't know. I personally don't think it's that, on, you know, if somebody were to inquire, just, you know, I got, I'm too busy at work or whatever. Anyway, whatever. I don't, I don't see being flooded with inquiries as to why one took out, you know, decided not to pursue it, you know, two years maybe after submitting the CAF. I just think it's, it's too easy for, it's just, I mean, it, there's some people that always submit CAFs and they never get appointed or they may not get an interview. And I think it just seems like it's too much control for someone to have. I mean, even on the town manager level, you know, to just say, I don't want to interview the, you know, because some people aren't called, you know, aren't called for interviews. So I just think it should be, and if you don't, if there's some concern about not posting the calf itself, I mean, even if there could just be, you know, a list of names of calves received, because it's not confidential when you submit, when you apply that you've applied. I mean, it's right as it's part of the public process. No, I don't think it is, is it? I, I think that it's it's completely anonymous, like it's not open to the public at all. So not even the fact that you've applied. Right. So yeah, there's got to be a happy medium between somebody just being able to look and it just make a decision by themselves. These are the people I want to interview. These are the people I don't. Yeah. And I will just, just inject one comment, Mandy, and then um, just to say that uh, I heard from several members of the community um, when the applications were open for the AHRA um, that applied that either didn't, you know, didn't, whatever cuts there are, or however that process works, they didn't get, you know, and were confused actually about why. Like that's the other piece of this is like what is the feedback loop? So right. I mean, Carol's experience is horrifying. That's horrifying. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And if you don't get a call, or if you don't get an interview, or if you do get an interview and you don't get selected, like what is the feedback process for that? You know that that, that is being offered, um, and that I think is a concern, especially as we're really talking about representation and diversification, all of that inclusion. I think that, um, yeah, I'm leaning on the side of that. But but then again, I feel like the fl flip side is I if they are public, that will be scrutinized. People will be looking and saying, why did Paul choose these people and not this person. And um, that's just the nature of what will happen, I think. So do we know what other towns tend to do? I don't know. Do you, Mandy, you can go ahead. So Maybe. a couple of things and I'll, I'll start with Jennifer's questions first. Um, I believe Northampton is totally public, I think. I know GOLs looked at this, so it's, it's a wide range. In certain, some towns they are public and other towns they are not. Um, the next thing I want to say is I think we need to split and what I've been hearing from Pat, Jennifer, and Michelle, I think relates to more of the manager appointments that the council is then supposed to confirm or not confirm um, and the secrecy surrounding them versus the council appointments. And I was speaking in some sense more towards the council appointments appointments where we have a specific application where we do actually then after the cap is just the start the submission of the soi is once someone submits that their name becomes public even if they withdraw later that becomes public so we actually do have what it, from the council side i would say we might have reached that happy medium and i i won't say we have but but i'll explain yeah. you know some of what I've been doing in CRC by keeping, while I have kept the names, except once you get to SOIs, the names stay private. Some of the sheets when we're talking about sufficiency of applicant pool um, last spring started with things like, here's how many CAFs we had that had that two year look back. This was the number of them. These were the numbers that were currently on, say the planning board. Um, 
I can probably pull up one of these documents if you give me a little time to find it. Here's how many responded to my email asking to submit a new CAF if you were interested. Here's how many did. And so we, I, I started trying to disclose numbers, which might potentially be that happy medium where it says, well, we started with CAFs over the last two years of 25. And then per the policy, we had to email 22 of them because the other three came in after the bulletin board notice. Of those 22, we heard from four that said, no, I'm not interested, six that submitted a new CAF, and I never heard anything from the other, whatever, that would be 12, right? <laughs> um, of those that said they were interested, these are the numbers that got the went to the next stage of saying you need to submit an SOI. Right. And that's how many people. And from that number, we got three SOIs, even though we had technically 10 applicants at the time we determined the pool was sufficient. We got three SOIs. Now you've got the names of the three SOIs. And so I what I would like to hear is, is that sort of a. And, and then we could do better. The report that then writes when we make a recommendation has the applicant pool demographics of those who submitted SOIs. And we actually started adding into that most recently with, I think, planning board, the demographics of the current members of the planning board, too, as a separate sort of line. And so one thing we could add is demographics of that first 20 or something, you know, or that first pool before the SOIs to get that better feel of where we are overall versus where we were with the SOIs how what are people's thoughts on that as sort of that protection of potential privacy but also opening before we talk about the manager i know has refused to do even how many people he interviewed like he won't even give us that number let alone how many calves of that whatever he looks back checked that box right and so there's there's that discussion to be had and the council discussion to be had and i'd love to hear if people think what the council's been doing in terms of disclosing numbers and some of what I've started trying to do to make some of those numbers a little more public without disclosing names is getting closer to potentially that compromise of privacy versus transparency. Thank you, Mandy. Jennifer? So I just want to cover with the uh, council um, committees, anyone who completes the process gets an interview, right? Right, so I'm comfortable with that. The, the, the issue is on the town manager appointment where there's no transparency. Yeah. And um, can someone help me understand? So there's a, a resident, not a resident oversight board, but a, is it a resident? Resident, resident advisory committee. Advisory committee. Okay. And so the resident advisory committee is the interview body for the town appointed committees. Is that right? Um, not solely. I believe the manager is normally either the manager or someone that he appoints, maybe uh, his assistant or the department head or something, someone from the resident advisory committee and generally someone from the who's currently on whatever committee they're interviewing. Right, for. that's he, what happens. In his memo, he always details who was on the interview committee. Yes, yes, okay. I know for the commi committee I was on, um, there was always, and I don't know why I'm, I'm blanking on her name. No, Connie Kruger was always in the interview representing the resident advisory. Okay, and I think Meg Gage is now on the, I remember being, is now on the resident advisory. Um, I know for AHRA in particular, a separate interview team was put together that was made up of people of color to do that. Um, so um, there was but transparency the town, around that. Oh, sorry, go ahead, Jennifer. No, but the town manager would have picked the people to be interviewed. Yes. So that I person, so. I don't think, sees the pool that he picked from. Yeah, I think you're probably right about that. Yeah, yep. You mean, did that interview group see the poll or they just saw the people that came, that he chose that came? Right. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. Um, well, I want to just answer Mandy, because I think Mandy, so I think we're having two separate discussions here in some ways. Um, and so let's focus on the council side right now, because it feels like the town manager appointed committees is a bigger discussion that we have. It should be addressed, right? It's, How do we? 
Definitely. A hundred percent. Yeah. We, we definitely want to address it. Um, so just staying with the council right now, um, the process is that you fill out the calf, just to correct me if I'm wrong, you fill out the calf and then um, you get, and, and then that goes to all council members. Who else does it go to at that point? Um, council, Athena, Paul, kind of that group. So the CAF goes to town council at, so whoever's on the town council at email gets a copy of the CAF at the time that that's submitted. So that means when the council switches over in January of 2024, mm -hmm. even though there's a look back of two years, the council, the current councilors won't have seen the actual CAFs for those last two years counselors on the specific committee that does the recommending have access to those calves, at least in the CRC SharePoint folder, because we've tried to centralize the record keeping so that calves don't get lost and, and with spreadsheets and all so that calves don't get lost and record keeping is a little easier for those transfers. But yeah, in theory, all the counselors have access to the calves. Mm -hmm. And then the SOIs that are submitted, everyone submitted an SOI gets interviewed and everyone submitted an SOI, their SOI becomes public and um, their name becomes public mm -hmm. at the SO once they've submitted the SOI. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, that process feels, I'm not seeing any major problems with it, but. Me too, I agree. Yeah. So uh, Mandy, what you were actually wanting to make a, so tell me what exactly was, and I'm, I'm sorry, I haven't looked at the memo for a minute, but what was the recommendation that you were wanting to make on this? So I, I didn't have a, I, this was not my referral. Um, oh, I think someone okay. else brought this okay. to GOL. Um, All right. I just wanted to be part of this conversation because I know I've been, in some sense, I guess I would say, in the past majority because they are still um not public um but i i i felt like i might have a different view to bring to this committee's discussion and i i don't know I, if we go to the manager ones if the manager is not interviewing every person who has submitted a calf within a certain amount of time whether that be after the bulletin board notice or xyz then we've got problems and i will absolutely admit that um you know, he should be. Everyone who submits that calf should be able to be interviewed for that position if he sets a specific time frame. Yeah, maybe not the past two years, but but as Jennifer and them said, if we're comfortable with how we've done how to get to that interviews, maybe we should be trying to figure out how to get the manager to comply with that sort of method somehow. Mm -hmm. Stick it in his goals. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> um, I will say that I think, I mean, and this has nothing to do with how I view Paul, but if the calves are public, it will put more pressure on Paul to be real or whoever the town manager is to really have awareness around the representation and the process and all of that kind of thing. I think I, I, at least it would for me, you know, I mean, I would try to look at it either way that way, but I think that it would, it's definitely a public process, I think brings more awareness to these things that we're trying to change. And this is truly the institutional structural change that we're trying to achieve here. Um, and so I think that our stated goals of doing that, this would very much be aligned with that. Jennifer, I, I'm going to go to you, but I would love, Athena, do you happen to have the referral on this easily accessible right now? I just want to make sure I understand what the actual referral was. I'm just looking to see if I can find it for you.
I'm curious if the referral was related to or whoever brought it forward or where it got referred was uh, was specific to town manager appointed bodies. So uh, I don't want to interrupt Jennifer because Jennifer's in line, so I'll just raise my hand. Yeah, Jennifer, go ahead. Um, Say, I think I lost my train of thought. That's so I'm sorry. Hard. I mean, you wait a while. <laughs> Go to Mandy, it'll come back. I'm going to interrupt Athena. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Mandy, I think. Oh, no. I, I know what I was oh, just going to say. Okay. It goes without saying that, you know, of course, it's no reflection on the town. It's just because we have to look at it structurally, because Paul's not always going to be there. Absolutely. But yeah. Absolutely. And also we're all just like human beings and we do actually like have these biases, even if we're really aware, yeah. you know, um, Athena. The referral was to refer to the GOO committee for review and recommendation, the matter of the public record status of CAFs. It wasn't specific to town manager or council appointments. Got it. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay, Mandy. So I went back to two of Paul's recent memos, appointment memos, um, one for Recreation Commission and one for Local Historic District Commission. And both of them in his summary of process indicate he, quote, interviewed all candidates who expressed interest. Um, for for historic local historic district, it was a little different because he said he interviewed all candidates who expressed interest in either of the two commissions, the historical commission or the local historic district commission. Um, as in this one, he said, as we discovered, many were not clear what the differences between the two commissions were. Um, I can try and find the the memo for AHRA or something, but. Um, He's stating in his memos that he's interviewed all candidates who have expressed interest. We don't know what that time frame is, number one. Um, and so maybe one of the things we need to have TSO asking, what's the time frame for all candidates expressing interest? Because clearly counselors are hearing that not everyone is getting interviewed. Um, and so more description on that statement might be helpful in our discussions here. So maybe we just need to bring Paul in to discuss what some of those statements mean. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess I, um, I think that this is a place that I'm putzing with in my brain. There are assumptions and there's more or less facts. And I don't know, um, and maybe some of you do, whether there is an assumption that somebody didn't even get a call or an interview or um, they got it and they didn't want to go forward with it. And, and I bring that up because the only reason we knew Carol didn't get an interview was because Mac told her and he was on the committee. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so I think a lot of assumptions are made <laughs> that aren't necessarily accurate, I guess. Yeah, right. Like we don't, we don't know. I mean, I have, I, I have at least one person who has told me that they did not, you know, receive an interview. So I, I that's all the extent of it. And there could yeah, be, but that's important. That's a fact. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Is there are people who say I submitted it. I've heard people say I submitted it and then they see that the appointments have been filled and yeah, they didn't even know the interview process happened. Right. Right. I also had an interesting case um, in, in that where um, there was a person who expressed interest that is integral to our community, works in our community, but was but is not a resident any longer of our community. And, um, and, and I think the justification for not giving that person the opportunity to interview was that they, and that is in our rules somewhere. I don't know where that is, but that is maybe a separate matter because this person, from my point of view and this personal opinion I'm sharing would have been really fantastic to uh, be on the committee. And so um, it was disappointing that that 
being how integral they are to this community that because of their resident status in the community, they weren't able to move forward with the process. Yes, Pat. Yeah, I wonder as, as a slightly separate part of that, whether or not we can think a, as a council about whether we want to have advisory people who meet the kind of criteria that you're talking about. Um, like we have on the uh, finance committee, we have three residents. Who, uh, they are residents, but they're non-voting. Um, and if, if this person or people like that wanted to make a commitment to work on a committee, they were interviewed and they were selected to do that by whatever whoever the selection, uh, then not having a vote might be critical because then you still have the, uh, the, the experience, the information, the creativity of a specific person, but I don't know, but committees can get very large <laughs> in that way. So I don't know. But also is there language to be added like uh, residents and Emmer stakeholders, you know, if you work in a school or you, you know, anyway, I think Athena is going to tell us we're getting off topic. It's a, yeah, it's a much longer decision because <laughs> Athena Bob and Ruth Simmons would be a great person on our committee, but she shouldn't be voting in Amherst. Yes. I, I'm not going to tell you that you're oh. off topic. I'm going to tell you that the charter Thanks. says that appointments to multiple member bodies um, in, in that section under the town managers, um, fun, the executive function, it says that members of all appointed multiple member bodies shall be residents of the town at the time of appoint, appointment and throughout the term of the appointment unless otherwise approved by the town council. I think we in, encountered this only once before. Maybe Mandy has a better recollection than I do. And it was a Pelham resident in terms of an appointment or we were looking at maybe appointing them because they were my memory is hazy on this, but I think we so the local it once historic before. district commission has to have an architect and a realtor. They could not find a realtor that lived here. So the realtor lived in Pelham, worked in Amherst, had grown up in Amherst, but they had to make an exception because it couldn't be filled otherwise. Yes. However, we might not. Oh, sorry, man. I was just going to quickly say we might not even know if you know if it if it's sort of at the discretion of the town manager, I think at that, like how would, if somebody came forward to apply for a town manager committee and the town manager did not bring them in for an interview because of them being an outside, outside of the community, how would the council know that, you know what I mean? To, in order to actually have that discussion Per the charter, that's um, if that makes any sense, Mandy. Yeah. So Athena and Jennifer are right. The council's done it at least once and voted to um, approve a non-resident appointment. It is part of the charter, so we can't change the rule that we'd have to approve that person separately. Um, but maybe it's worth making recommendations to the manager. The charter doesn't say anything about any criteria for reasons to approve someone who's not a resident right so it doesn't say like unless prove you know a, has to be a resident unless for extraordinary circumstances you can't find someone right like it doesn't put any limitations on the council's approval of non-resident appointments <clears throat> so maybe it would be if we find this a problem we could ask the manager how many times does he get non-residents applying and in what circumstances um, and would he like guidance from the council on in what circumstances the council would sort of, I hate using the word approve, like to see non-residents interviewed and considered mm -hmm. in equal quantity, in equal qualifications or, or whatever to residents instead of just immediately dis discarded with, nope, you're not a resident, I won't even interview you. Like, is there a way would he like guidance from the council mm -hmm. on when the council would be open to that separate approval of non-residents? Um, so a question to the manager like that might be helpful to find out. But, and also how many non-residents do we get, right? <laughs> I don't know. And, and when we get them, are they generally employees at UMass or employees in town or you know, they might be landowners in town? I could see the Agricultural Commission I think has had this problem before. 
um, where the the it's a it's an owner or a worker on the farm that operates in town, mm. but doesn't live in town, lives across the border in Hadley because half the farm's in Hadley, half of it's in Amherst, you know, things like that. Um, yeah, that's great. And it sounds like we'll be bringing Paul if he's available on the 9th to talk about town manager goals. So we can put this back on the agenda, maybe ask that he could stay um, to give us some feedback on this matter as well. And so we'll couple those together. Um, Pat, did you have, um, Mandy, your hand is still up. You're muted. I just have one more thing I'd like to say. I think, you know, one thing that would be very helpful if we can convince the manager to do is release numbers. Um, you know, that's one thing we operate blind with, right? Um, when we get an appointment memo, it just says all candidates were interviewed. We never even know how many that is. We get an appointment for one person. We get an appointment for five people, depending on <laughs> how, how bad the committee is in that. Um, it would be helpful to know if, if his all candidates were interviewed statement was one interview, one spot, or was it six interviews, one spot, or six interviews, three spots. And yeah. that doesn't disclose privacy information, but it does help with transparency. And so maybe we can get some of that demographic information that the council's disclosing, some of the numbers that the council's disclosing to get Paul to disclose in his appointment memos. It's yeah. definitely helpful to know if one person applied. <laughs> Right. Yeah. And and also that's really important just in terms of engagement. Like yeah. we're consistently only getting three people applying and the same three people applying and those people aren't getting, you know, something's wrong. <laughs> um, all right. So I want to make sure we approve the minutes. If everyone had an opportunity to review them, let me just pull this up. Um, and Mandy, I know you were not here, but I think you can still vote on them if, uh, or choose yep. to vote. Your, okay. So I am moving to adopt the October 12th, 2022 meeting minutes. Second. Okay, great. Any discussion? All right. Uh, Jennifer? Yes. Pat? Aye. Uh, Mandy? I and I'm an I. Um, so I before we are finished, I just want to review what we'll be doing then on the ninth and see if there are any other items. Um, it sounds like we will have the water regulations bylaw, um, and that will be well, so see, this is. If it's going back to TSO, I'm a little, the way this process has worked, it's been a little bit confusing to me. Um, we'll have a legal opinion. Maybe it, that should go to, for TSO to take it the under. TSO, yeah. And TSO's then, next meeting is what, the third, Jennifer? Oh, TS, no, I don't think they're meeting on the third. So are they the 10th? <laughs> Yes. Yes. Anna, Which means, oh, oops, sorry. Oh, no, go with Ina. Uh, Anna had asked, posed all those questions to the town manager about the, the bylaws. So my understanding is that TSO is going to take them both up, the water and the sewer bylaws, before they come back to GOL. Is that, are, are we all, we what we're thinking? Okay. I think that's what kind of got determined today. I hadn't, I thought when we got the legal review that it would, it was, I didn't realize it was going back to TSO, but it sounds like there's going to be more substantive discussion that needs to happen. So um, I think it would be helpful if, if anyone has substantive changes they want to recommend TSO make that they get shared with TSO ahead of their discussion so we can take all of those into consideration. And Mandy, you've probably got some some changes so um that, that would probably be helpful to get to TSO before they start that conversation great okay so then next time we meet we will have our second discussion of the town manager goals hopefully with paul we'll come back to the um calves hopefully also with paul um we can do the scoring matrix and the other there were the other rules referrals that I didn't have on this agenda, but that have been on the previous agenda that we still haven't, I don't think, 
did we address? No, I don't think we addressed those last time. Um, so we have all of that. And then are there any other agenda items? I'm, I'm trying to think. Uh, Athena, yes, please. I believe the regulations. So oh, great. If they're, okay. if they're not ready to pass them now, then I think I think they need to pass them before you make them. Yeah, Athena, just so you know, you're um, coming in and out. I don't know if it's your new headset or what, but I I could at least barely hear you. Sorry about that. This thing kind of slips down and, oh, and I forget that it's not there. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I, I don't notice because it's out of my eyesight. But um, I was just saying that the sewer regulations are, are all set from TSO. So I'm not sure if you want to take them up at the same time that you do the water and sewer bylaws. We had talked about adopting those, you know, not at the same time and the complication of that. So it might be helpful to just do them all at once. Okay, great. Um, we also had a referral um, that was going to finance committee first. What was that? Um, oh my gosh. It wasn't, anyone remember? It was something recent. I that was the water regs that yeah. we questions about, but that we determined finance had answered already. No, there was something else that a counselor brought forward that was referred to or counselors brought forward. It wasn't the street light. So no. street lights are in TSO right now. Okay. And maybe finance. Um, transfer fee from Anna and I is in finance. That's the one. Okay. So that I don't that know whether been... it's anywhere else but finance. But That's then it would come one. to us. It's not done finance yet. No. <laughs> I'm I that's gonna be a tough one to get. there's a lot in finance. Um okay, all right. So <clears throat> sounds like we are good. Are there any other? There's no one else in the attendees, so I'm not gonna call another public comment. I don't have anything else that wasn't anticipated. Are there any other comments, member comments? Oh, good meeting. Great meeting. Yeah, really good. Nice to see you all. And I'm going to adjourn at 1059 a.m. Thank you. Okay. Thank okay. you. Bye-bye.